Hey, my name is Taklas, and today we're going to be looking at the absolute basics in Project Spark. Now, if you're a new person to Project Spark, and you download the game with super high expectations that the game was going to be amazing, and that you've seen trailers of people building, like, AAA quality games, and recreating Tetris, and recreating Zelda, and Skyrim, and making the most absurd board games and all that, and then you open up your world, and it looks a little something like this. And you're feeling maybe a little bit let down, and you're also feeling a little bit maybe, um... Like you have no idea what's going on. You don't know where to start, you don't know where to be in. There's not a ton of resources for this game, because it's kind of a new game, and it's kind of exclusive on Xbox One and Windows 8. The footage that you're seeing is on Win uh, Xbox One, by the way. Um, so, I'm here to teach you the basics of Project Spark, the fundamentals on... The world, the objects, and how the code functions. I'm not going to be giving much, much for specifics on how code functions. As in, like, showing a tutorial on how to make him fly or something. I have lots of other tutorials on my channel for that. Which, if you check out and subscribe, it would probably help you make some awesome worlds. So, but what I'm going to do first, I'm going to go over the absolute basics of Project Spark. So, you've created your world. You have this boring looking character and a flat world. This hexagon pattern is the default pattern paint or terrain color uh, that Project Spark offers. But I'm sure that you want to do more than just deal with a flat world. So let's look at what you've got at your disposal. First, we have terrain. Actually, let me just hop in game. We have terrain. These are different terrain options. The terrain options are pretty varied. They allow you to manipulate and build the terrain a little bit like clay. And uh, it's really versatile. You can make lots of things. Um, you have add, subtract, remove, rough, smooth, plateaus, caves, stuff like that. There's a lot you can do. Uh, terrain is a mostly static entity. It doesn't change much. There are games that allow you to change terrain in game, but uh, that's fairly advanced. And you cannot apply code to the terrain. Now, you can paint the terrain so it looks like this, and it has grass and walls and all that, and that's all very dynamic. You don't need to worry about using like five different paints to make it look like that. So, that's terrain. Um, if you use the wizard to create a world, this will do a lot of the terrain for you. Next, let's look at the three different types of objects. We have character objects, we have tumbling objects, and we have fixed objects. Character objects and character models are objects that react like characters. When I punch them, they react right, they flinch, they look away, they have animations, and when I push them around, they always stay upright because that's what a character would do. Tumbling objects are similar, except that you can also push them around in the world like this, but they'll roll and they'll tumble because they're called tumbling objects. And then finally, we have fixed objects. This is probably what you're going to be doing 95% of your building with fixed objects. They cannot move. They will not move unless you put special code to them. But you can interact with them. Things will happen. That chest gave me a coin. So, fixed objects. Now, Project Spark allow allows you to break some of these rules and assign what kind of player, or what kind of object type you want. So I'm going to go over here. Now, this uh, wolf here, I can't move him. I made him into a fixed object. He won't move. He'll never move, no matter what I did. I could, I could bring all the explosives in the world here, and it would never move this wolf. So, he is a fixed object. This ball won't roll. It'll stay upright, but it won't roll. That's because it is a character model, or a character type, not a character model. And then finally, we have this thing, and it tumbles, and it rolls, and it does everything that we want it to. Actually, that, that looks pretty cool right there. So, those are the different types of characters. Uh, it's worth mentioning that character models differentiate from most models in the sense of that they have animations built in, like the wolf, he's, he's looking around, he'll growl if I punch him and stuff like that. Same with these guys. So, that's the basic different types of objects, and keeping those straight will help you out. So, let's look now at how code functions. This is probably the more important piece. Let's grab our player, and we're just gonna go into his brain. This is the default one, unmodified, that came with your world. And I'm gonna hit X until everything's gone. 
There, look at that. We don't have anything now. Now the name of the brain and the name of the page up there in the corner, uh, those are usually insignificant, so don't worry about those just yet. Code works. Um, if you've ever dealt with if then statements, this is the same thing. What happens is that this brain is looking for something to happen so that it can do something and react to it. So when, when is looking for something to happen or a status to be uh, met or a status to be broken. So for example, everything around here has something to do with time or an event taking place. So let's say we go to something like sensor. These are probably some of the most basic ones. When detect, detect is looking for any other object, not terrain, mind you, object. Now when detect, and let's say that we want this to be a little more specific, rather than any object in the entire world, we want to go to objects and in world picker. And when it detects, let's do this anvil right here. When it detects this anvil, the do side of this line of code will allow us to do anything that we want to it within one line of code. So let's say when detect anvil, we're going to do appearance highlight, and this will put a colorful glow around currently our character. Now let's say that we want the anvil to glow. Since we're detecting an anvil, that anvil is thus an it as defined here. The it is looking for a piece of code in the when to reference. Equally so, we could do highlight in world picker and we could select the anvil again. It works the same way. It is just a little bit more uh, fluid per se and a little more stable at times. So when detect anvil, highlight anvil. Now problem here is our character can't move, he can't see, he can't do anything. So really quickly, I'm going to make him uh, moving control. So we go to control, and these will be different if you're on PC, but as you can see, I have a keyboard option too. So if, even if you're on Xbox One, you can design it specifically for PC. Although I think the controls automatically go between the two. So controller, when, let's see, right stick, I believe it is, move. The game is smart enough to know that you, you don't have to tell it when right stick up, move forward, when back, move backward, when left, move left, move right, right. The game is smart enough to know that any direction that the right stick points, you will move in that direction. This is a pretty smart game. It takes a lot of the heavy lifting of game coding away from you. And then next, we need to assign it a camera. So I want it to be a follow camera. This will follow you in the third person. Oh, now something worth mentioning. Currently we are what's in no, what's known as creator mode. This is a mode where time is stopped. The world is in one place um, and you can preset everything with code and all that kind of fun stuff. And then to test it, you pause it, you hit test. And now we go into the game world. What happens in the game world does not ref change the creator world. So I'm back here. And it looks like I got my joysticks a little bit mixed up. Usually I want my left joystick to run, but it works. When we get near this anvil, it highlights it white. How cool is that? I think it's pretty cool. Now when we get away from it, it unhighlights it because we're no longer detecting it. So let's go back to our player. And just because it will annoy me, I'm turning that back to left stick. Let's say that you want more than one thing to happen to this anvil. That's not a problem. Now you could do the same line again. We're gonna insert a new line of code by clicking the left joystick and we could do another one detect anvil. Let's say we also wanna make it, oh, what should we make it do? Let's make it also a hologram. And this time I'm gonna use it just to show that it works the same way. Now. This would work. Let me actually go in game and show you. That would work. There's nothing technically speaking wrong with doing code this way. Now it glows white as well because we made it a hologram. However, there's a much more efficient way to go about this, especially when you're going to be stacking 
more than, say, three lines of code together. Instead of looking for the same when property multiple times, I'm going to delete this line of code. I'm going to insert a new line of code, and I'm going to click the number with my A button and bump it to the right. Now, this just got indented, meaning this is now a child line of code to this parent line of code, meaning this child line of code will not run ever until this parent line of code is met. So until we have detected the anvil, and this is also important, while we're still detecting the anvil, this the following lines of code will immediately stop the second we stop detecting the anvil. While we're detecting the anvil, we can also do hologram it. It still works even as a parent or a child line of code. And we can leave the when empty because the when here fills it in, so to speak. However, we can add more than that. Let's say that we want it to count down one second before it holograms. We can now stack multiple whens inside of each other. This is very big deal. Uh, <laughs> this is the base of so much code that you're seeing right here. Now, if you're curious, I don't even know if there's a limit to how many child lines of code you can have. Let's see how far Project Spark will take us. Because I know that you can make some of these lines of code really, really long. So I just keep making new lines of code and bumping them over to the right. Now, as you can see, this is a lot of child line of code. That's a lot. And you know what? I honestly think I could probably reach 30 or 40 without a problem. I'm not going to do that. Now, it is worth noting, if you delete a parent line of code, you also delete all child lines of code. So if I was to delete this, they're all gone. Now that's handy, and it also works the same when you're moving lines of code, but it's also something to be aware of. Now speaking about moving lines of code and their order, the way that Project Spark reads code is it reads code from top to bottom instantly. However, it reads it in order. The best way I can describe this is that the game will go through in one frame, which is the smallest amount of time this game has to work with, which is 1 30th of a second, and it will read uh, line one, detect anvil, and then it will read line two, and then it will read line four, three, and then it will read, ah, come on. And then it will read line four, and then it would keep on reading the lines. Now it's important to know that it re reads these lines of code in order because it will do their functions in order. Let's say we made a block. We grab this block over here. We put it down and I'm gonna go into the brain and I'm going to do when interacted, you don't need to worry about this too much right now, when interacted and I'm gonna make some child lines of code make a couple. Now let's say that I want it to create a special effect and then disappear. What I would want to do is play effect, gallery picker, and then let's pick a cool effect. Let's do berserker start. This is one of my favorites. And then destroy. Now something worth mentioning just for the sake of efficiency, when you put the destroy tile on, you can do with effect and then select your effect. So uh, there's a more efficient way to do this. However, if I was to do it right now, it would work just the way I want it to. Oh, it just occurred to me I don't have an interact property built into my playable character yet. So let's give this a countdown timer instead. So countdown timer four. So let's take a look at our block right here. And in four seconds, it'll go poof and then disappear. And there we go. You see, that looked nice. However, the game read these two lines of code instantly, however, in order. So it played this effect first, and then it destroyed it. If we were to rearrange it, and even though it's reading them both at the exact same instant, one frame, it will destroy it without playing that effect. So we watch it, and boop, just gone. So, it's important to know how the page reads the code how Project Spark reads the code as well. You know, I'm just gonna delete this block. So, um, one, one more thing. When you're on a page of code, this is called a page of code that we're on right now, 
you can use your bumpers to go to the next page of code. Another page of code is like a clean slate that you can write fresh new code on. And for the sake of the simplicity that we're doing right now, you can switch between pages in code. However, when you're on a page of code, no code on any other page will run. So if we have this code on this page, and then we do, oh, when, why? Now we're gonna switch page to the next page. If this is starting to get overwhelming, don't worry, hang on, I'll show you as best as I can how to do this. Pages can be a little scary, but they're also very helpful. Now I'm gonna copy and paste some of this code to the second page. So, how about on the second page, we remove the hologram and instead simply make the anvil a different color. The highlight of it, yeah? So this is the page that we start on. The game defaults to page one. Now we can switch it to page two and this will have the same code except it will not allow us to hologram the anvil and it will highlight the anvil blue. Now I'm also going to copy and paste this so that we can switch back because once you've left a page, you can return at any time. So let's give this a test. Let's run over to our anvil right here. And he should glow and then hologram because we put a timer on that earlier. Now, when I switch pages, because we also switched between cameras, it had that little bit of a, a zoom in, zoom out because it reset the camera. Usually you won't have a problem with that because you won't be switching pages on characters all that often. See, now we switched and it only has a blue outline. When we switch again, oh, just realized I did something. There we go. So, the thing that I just realized is that I did when Y on both pages. And since the game counts in frames, that meant that the instant I pressed Y, it advanced to the next frame. And then when I pressed, when I was still holding the Y button down, even though it was a quick tap, it switched back. So, we should put the modifier pressed on both sides. There we go. So, that is pretty much the absolute basics of Project Spark. From here, you can do all kinds of things. I may do another basics video on maybe setting up your world and setting up your main character a little bit better, but that is how you can put down terrain, the different types of uh, models and their settings, their physics settings, and then how Project Spark reads codes. So I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, please, Leave a comment, message me on YouTube, message me on Xbox. I'd love to help out. I've put, oh man, by now I've cleared 500 hours into this game. This game, oh my goodness. Once you really get hold of the potential of this game, this game can become addicting because the games that you wanna play are the games that you can make. It's not like, oh man, I like this game, but I wish it had this element. It's suddenly, I can make that game with this element. It's it's an energy, it's a passion, it's a, it's, it's, it's powerful. This game has so much energy and power to it that it's just, that's the reason I'm making these tutorials is because I want to share what I've learned because I'm pretty much entirely self-taught and that took most of my 500 hours to do. And I want to make that process easier for other people so they can get creating the worlds that they want because the worlds that you guys will create will be nothing along what I create. And I want to see more excellent worlds out there. So <laughs> there was my little... My little spiel of energy right there. So I hope this video was helpful. If you're new to Project Spark, stick with it. This is not an easy game to start learning, but it is a game that you can create amazing things in. So I hope this video is helpful. If you have any questions, once again, comment, message, whatever. Um, if you want regular tutorials and critiques of other Project Spark worlds, you can give this channel a uh, subscribe. That'd be helpful. I don't usually ask for subscriptions, but if it helps you out, go for it. So. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys later.